The Bible says in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And that lets you know that the presence of the Lord is the right hand of the Lord. And the reason why I will find pleasure at his right hand is because I'm seated with Christ. So I find pleasure. I don't find pleasure by what life has to give to me. I don't find pleasure by how much money I make in my bank account. I don't find pleasure by the kind of job I have. I find pleasure at his right hand. At his right hand, there are pleasures forever. And the reason why many are trying to fill up the vacuum in their life is because they haven't found pleasure. <laughs> they haven't found pleasure. I always tell people, the most pleasurable thing to ever come in contact with is with the Lord. The reason for sin is pleasure. The reason for addictions is pleasure. But he says when you come to the right hand of the Lord, you will find pleasure. And pleasure is an ecstasy that will last forevermore. So you don't need to renew this pleasure. You won't get out of the high of this pleasure. There is no moment of vacuum when you find his right hand. So this pleasure will be eternal pleasures forevermore. Pleasures forevermore. And that's why when you come to hear the word of God, that is where you begin to interface and have intimacy with that pleasure. That's what gives you that pleasure. I always tell people the word of God is pleasurable. The word of God is ecstasy. Jeremiah said, I found thy word and I did eat them. And they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. I found thy word and I ate them. And what happened when I ate them was that the word became a joy and became the rejoicing of my heart. So my present situation, my present circumstances do not define where I derive my joy. I derive my joy from what I eat. You know, many, many people would say, the reason why I'm putting on weight is because I'm depressed. So because I'm depressed, I, I eat, I eat. Oh, find something else. If you find the word, it will become the joy and the rejoicing of your heart. In the face of that situation, if you can eat something else, it will change the state of your heart. You see, what God wants to do is to change the face of the heart of a man. Where God wants to interface is your heart. It's your heart. Your heart is the hallmark of God. Your heart is where God wants to dwell in eternally. Your heart is where God wants to enact his throne, his government, his will, his way. His runway is going to be in your heart. And if God's throne can find expression in your heart, it becomes your joy. Somebody say, I got the joy of the Lord. Louder say, I got the joy of the Lord. So at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. This brings us to what I was teaching last week, understanding spiritual authority. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Now we need to understand what the word right hand is. Are you still here? We need to understand what the word right hand is. Now when you hear the word right hand, right hand does not mean right hand as in left hand, right hand. Right hand means a place of authority. Right hand means a place of authority. So when the Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, he's connoting that Jesus is seated at the authority of God. The Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. It's not that God is sitting here, and Jesus is sitting here. That's what we think. But that's not correct. What 
that word right hand is connoting is that God delegated all his authority as God to the man Jesus the Christ. That means when you step into heaven or step into the plane of God and you are looking for God, you will not see God, you will see a man. And that man you will see, his name is Yeshua Hamashiach. And you will begin to wonder, I was looking for God, but how come I was looking for God? I stumbled over a man. Because if you would find God, you will find God in a man. God is expressed in a man. No man has seen God at any time. That's why the Bible says, how shall you say you love God and you don't love the brethren? How shall you say you love God and you don't love the image of God? Because God, you have never seen God at any time. So how do you claim, I love God. I love God. I love God. I love God, but you don't love the fellowship of the brethren. I love God, but you don't love prophet Christian. When I say, come to church and fellowship with me. If you love God, you will love me. And you will love my passion, which is the gospel that I preach. Oh, that's love. Love is expressed to your fellow brother. Because if you find God in your sister, you find God in your brother, you will love the God in them. So when you go to heaven, you will not see God. I, and, I know, and I know the image we have of God is one white man with white beards. You know, white beards like this and then white hair. And he's sitting on some golden stuff in the cloud. And so we feel when we begin to ascend to the cloud, ooh, 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 then we we'll see this white man with white beards. But it will interest you to know that the person you will see when you ascend to the height of God is a man. That's why it's very important for believers to understand the subject of authority. Are you still here? If you're here, shout amen. amen. If you're here, let me hear you shout amen. So the authority of God is with a man. It's with a man. You can't find the authority of God outside the scope of a man. The authority of God is with a man. So if you want to exercise authority, you will not go to God and beg God for authority. Because God has delegated authority to a man. Now, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. Let's open our Bibles quickly. Matthew 28 verse 18. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now let's analyze heaven and earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning God created heaven and earth. So like I said, God never intended for you to travel to heaven. You know, the, the goal of every believer is, I want to make heaven. I want to make heaven. It's a good, good deal. But heaven actually came to you the day you received Jesus. Heaven is not a plane that is far from the believer. Heaven is the reality of the believer right now, right here. Heaven came down and glory filled your soul. So heaven is not a prayer point of the believer. The believer has captured the realities of heaven. And that's why Paul told you, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. So if you're already seated there, what is the prayer to go? Because he said you're already seated there. So God created heaven and earth in the beginning. And so heaven and earth was supposed to be the jurisdiction of man. The two realms that man will exercise authority so man is supposed to exercise authority in heaven and exercise authority in earth so heaven will be on earth heaven on earth heaven on earth but because man sinned heaven separated from the earth so man lost authority in these two planes because man was supposed to have authority in the plane of heaven and in the plane of the earth so the day you give your life to Jesus, you function in two worlds. You function in two worlds. You function in heaven and you also function in earth. Are you still here? Please follow me. 
The day you gave your heart to Jesus, you function in two worlds. You function in heaven and you also function in earth. So if there is anything that is not working in earth, you know where to get it from. You travel to heaven. <laughs> are, you, are you still here? If anything is not working on earth, you know where to get it from. You travel to heaven, capture the realities in heaven, and bring it down on earth. That's why Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. The will of God is in a plane called heaven. In the control room called heaven. But in order for you to access it and make it reality here, you have to capture it in the control room called heaven and manifest it here on earth. So thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what is the will of God for your life? That's where you capture it. You capture the will of God for your life in the control room called heaven. If you are so focused on the earth, you would lose relevance. What is your will concerning my life, Lord? What is your will concerning my destiny? Then you need to ascend to heaven, capture what his will is for your life, and then bring it to manifestation. It's your responsibility. And that shows you why you must function in authority. Somebody say, I hear you. I hear you. Louder, say, I hear you. I hear you. Say, I function in authority. Louder, say, I function in authority. Louder, say, I function in authority. Shout amen. amen. So it says, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Now look at verse 19. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. What did he say you should go teach nations? What is he telling them to go teach nations? He's telling them to go teach nations about what he said. All power is given to me. And the word nations there means ethnos. It means your ethnic group. It means your sphere of contact. Go and teach them. And what are you supposed to teach them? The teaching them there is not, I'm going to teach them that God is going to give them a breakthrough. That's not what he said you should teach them. It's not God is going to give you a car, even though a car is good. But I'm going to teach them how to capture authority. And when they capture authority, whatever they need on earth will be manifested because they've captured authority. Go ye therefore teaching them, baptizing them. In fact, the reason for immersion in water is not just to feel nice and say, ah, 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 it's to capture authority. How come you are baptized in water, you came out no power? Didn't you see when Jesus was baptized in the Holy Ghost, in water, the Bible says, the voice of God echoed from heaven, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. The heavens opened over him. How come you, you immersed into water and that's when you even became more powerless? You are immersed into water, you became more powerless. It, now it has become a religious exercise. Devoid of power, devoid of authority. So water baptism is a show that I've come in contact with authority. That's what it should demonstrate. That's what it should actually demonstrate. It's not supposed to demonstrate you just feeling nice and getting wet. Because after that, that show, it shows that you've contacted a man called Jesus. That means after that show, what next? You're still weak. You're still sick. You're still bleak. You're still dark. You're still molested of devils. You're still running helter-skelter. You're still in doubt. How come you were baptized in water and you are in doubt? How come? And you are in doubt. Didn't you hear the voice of the Lord? This is my beloved son. Did he speak to you? Or you just went to a swimming pool? How are you in doubt? Because if you've captured the voice of God, you will not function in doubt. You will not function in fear. In spite of the situation. Somebody say, I have power. I can hear you say, I have power. Louder say, I have power. 
So the baptism there would be to demonstrate power. That's what baptism would be for. So he says, go ye therefore teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe. Teaching them to observe. So you see, what the authority of Jesus would do is to cause teaching, teaching, teaching. Are you seeing teaching there? Did you see teaching in your Bible? Teaching. Not dancing. Teaching. The Holy Ghost is not a dance instructor. The Holy Ghost is a teacher. That's the mission field of the Spirit of God. Teaching. I go into certain quarters, certain Christian denominations, and all they are doing is just dancing. And they call it the Holy Ghost. Meanwhile, they learned the dance at home. They practiced it, the leg walk. They practiced it at home just to come to show it at church. And they say, it's the Holy Ghost. I beg to differ. If you stayed with the Holy Ghost, you will be weak. All that gyrates, you will not, if you've seen the Holy Spirit, you, you, you will be humbled. And they will say, David dance. David dance. So I will dance like David dance. Are you David? David was a man after God's own heart. Can God say, you are a man after my heart? David said, I will not give God something that costs me nothing. What have you, what have you sacrificed for the gospel? You are, I'm like David. Chill. And David's dance was because the Ark of the Covenant was taken away. And now the Ark of the Covenant was being restored. And his dance was to give glory to God. But the Holy Ghost's responsibility when he was gifted at salvation was to teach. Because you can dance. And yet once you're done dancing, the devil is waiting for you at night. <laughs> are you done? <laughs> we are coming. <laughs> Warlocks and witches are waiting with their spells. And that's why I begin to see believers spells upon their lives. Demonic strongholds. In the lives of believers. And I begin to wonder. Lord is either something is not working. He said my people are not taught. My people are not taught. My people are not taught. Teaching them. Now how you know a disciple of Jesus. Or an apostle of Jesus. You know a man is sent by Jesus. He's going to teach them on this basis. Teaching them. Th that's how you know he's sent. Apostleship is not... When they wear you a collar huh? and decorate you with heavy garment and they bring jars of oil and they wear that long thing on your head. You know, one time in Nigeria, some college of apostles and bishops called me and said, young man, <laughs> I was in my 20s, we see your mighty move of God. We see that the hand of the Lord is upon thee. We want you to join our college of bishops and apostles. Oh, I'm a young prophet. I don't need to join the old prophet. Oh, no. I'm going to set myself apart, sir. So come, we need to ordain you into the council of apostles and bishops. We need to ordain you an apostle. I looked at them. I said, sir, sir, I'm an already an apostle. Eh? <laughs> So, what, what will you do? We will give you a signet ring. A ring. Oh! You want people to call me a voodoo priest? <laughs> ring. Huh? They will say, that's where his power is. That's, that's where his power. That's where his power is. Then they will wear you that garment. Then you will be walking like this. Then they will give you one long thing. You will be walking like this. Then you, you will now be puffed up with pride. Apostle. Don't you know who I am? I am an apostle. Apostle. Apostle, who sent you? Who called you? Because the word apostle is from the word apostolos, which means a sent one. A sent one. And Jesus is the one who sends. If you've not met Jesus, you are not sent. Oh, it doesn't matter your influence. You are not sent. And how you will know he sent? Teaching them. The heartbeat of an apostle is to teach. Teaching them. Because he said to them, go. He's sending them. So they are apostles. So their heartbeat will be teaching them to observe. To 
observe. <laughs> so I will come to you and I will check on you and say, are you observing the things I just taught you? Are you practicing it? I want to ensure that you're walking in the light of the victory of the cross of Jesus. Teaching them to observe all I commanded you. So what Jesus will tell to his sent apostle is a commandment. And this commandment is based on the authority that Jesus has received in heaven and on earth. If you're blessed, shout, I'm blessed. blessed. Are you blessed? If you're blessed, shout, I am blessed. blessed. Louder, shout, I am blessed. I want you to say, I have authority. I can't hear you say, I have authority. Hallelujah. Look at Genesis chapter 1 from verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And over all the earth, and over cattle, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. God said. You see, when God was creating, he spoke to things, and they became. But when God wanted to create man, he spoke to himself. You see, that word us does not mean three people. The word us means he was speaking to the essence of himself. Because in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. So in the beginning was the word and the spirit. So God spoke to the totality of himself. And said, let us make man. The totality of me make man. In my image and my likeness. Now there's a reason why he's making man in his image and his likeness and if you are truly the image and the likeness of God you would function in these responsibilities <laughs> let them have there's a reason why you're the likeness of God so if you're if you're not functioning in dominion then you are walking outside of the responsibility of being the image of God let them have it's not God that will have it for you let them have. So it's your responsibility. So if I'm truly the image of God, I have authority. The word dominion means authority. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over all the earth, and over the fowls of the air, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. He's showing you three multi layers of dominion the air. The land and the waters. Are you following me? Are you still with me? If you're here, shout, I'm here. I can't hear you. Shout, I'm here. He's not telling you that you have dominion over eagles. Do you have the strength of an eagle? Oh. He's not telling you you have dominion over lion. If I take you to a zoo and you contact a lion, he might tear you up. You are not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. An African prophet wanted to replicate what Daniel did. In the 1970s or in the 1980s. He said, I'm a prophet of God. So he said, everybody should come out. I will show you guys that I'm Daniel of the modern day. And he told them to put him in a zoo. Where a lion, boisterous, hungry lions were. He said, I will show you the power of my God. And God will shut the mouth of the lion. <laughs> oh, it didn't take 30 seconds. When he entered and the zoo attendants locked the gate. He was doing, Oluwao, Oluwao. <laughs> Meaning, God of Elijah, God of Daniel. <laughs> Show up in the name of Jesus. The lions came. <laughs> Jesus we know, but we don't know you. <laughs> hey, God of Daniel, send out fire. God of Daniel. Daniel, we recognize, but you, you have no authority. They bounced on him and ate him up. It's on Google. Search, research it. And that was the end of the destiny of that false prophet. Falsehood. So your authority is not over wild animals. Your authority is not over the whale. Oh, if going is, ah, have you met a crocodile before? An alligator? 
Oh, don't play. Don't go there. God said, I have authority over the fish of the sea. Uh, the whale will swallow you up. You know you're not Jonah. You're not Jonah. <laughs> don't try it. So, the dominion mandate is to three multi-layers. The air, the land, and the sea. Because there are princes that will rule in these three dimensions. There are princes. And where we get the word principality is from the word prince. In short, the word principality is from two compound words. Prince, municipal. Prince and municipal. Municipal means a jurisdiction. Prince means authority. So, principality. So, there are princes that rule in the air. There are princes that rule on the sea. And there are princes that rule on land. These three governing ways. Are you still with me? And these three governing ways is the three ways the gospel would travel. Oh, you're not there. These three governing ways is the three ways the gospel would travel. So what God is saying is he wants you to extend the frontiers of his kingdom in every place, in every realm, in every way. So to have dominion and authority in these three multi-layers will not come without a fight. It will not come without a fight. That's why authority must be exercised. Authority must be exercised. The days of lazy Christianity is over. These are not the days of weak Christianity. These are not the days of five minutes prayer. These are not the days of that two minutes prayer. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers. And rulers of darkness. A principality is an authority that has come to govern a community, a family, and a jurisdiction. So they start with a family. And then they spread into a community. And then over a region. And that's why you see certain people have certain things that continually happens in their family line. Even though they are born and it keeps happening and it looks like it's about to happen to them. Now it's not supposed to happen to them but it looks like. Because this believer has not given the Holy Ghost the free way. He's not exercising his authority. So Paul says, give no place to the devil. He's saved. But there are certain things, certain strongholds that has been manifested in his family line. So in order for me to stop a gender of wickedness, that prince that rules in my family, I have to wrestle. It will not come without a fight. Oh, you were born into the Ekbe Samuel's family. And they said there, my ancestors worshipped idols. So it never allowed anyone to rise. It never allowed anybody to become anything. Never. All my uncles useless. Aunt is useless. So I saw youthlessness. I was a child. Who told you? You can't arise and become that Deborah in your family. Who told you? I was a child and I could look at I said, no. Is this how my life will become? In fact, one day I told one of my aunties what I wanted to study in college. If I would ever go to college. I was 10 when I said to her, I want to be a petroleum engineer. She laughed me to scorn. And she said, <laughs> in a family where nobody has become anything. I was 10. Because in her mind, how will these things be? How come? How? Possible? How? How? But if God be for us. Who can be against us? She could not fathom the mind of a 10 year old born in abject poverty saying he wants to become something great. But it's possible if there was something like that in your family. But unfortunately, sir, there's nothing like that. So she laughed. But she did not know that in my spirit as a child I had captured the realms of God. I've captured the realities of the word of God concerning my destiny. And so it will not go without a fight. So I practiced warfare. I practiced authority because I know that these things will rise its ugly head.
If I said, I will change the trajectory of my family. I will, I will. I told myself. I was 10 years old. So there's no excuse. Oh man, thou art inexcusable. There's no excuse. My mother did not do anything for me. There's no excuse. I was born in the slum. There's no excuse. I was born in the ghetto. There's no excuse. My mother never did anything for me. There is no excuse. If you have authority, you can change the trajectory of your life and your destiny. Somebody shout, I hear you. Lord, I say, I hear you. So I wrestled. She laughed because she looked, my father was poor, my mother was poor. Not just poor, the poor called us poor. The poor called us poor. Where we would go beg for pepper, pepper, pepper from our other neighbors in the slum. We, we all lived in the slum. But those neighbors had pepper and salt. So when my mom is cooking, my mom could not afford pepper and salt. So she would send us as kids. Because if she goes to the other neighbor and asks for pepper or salt, the neighbor will be like, oh. But if we go as kids, to say, ah, mama, mama, chipeze. <laughs> please, give us salt and pepper. My mom is cooking. Give us pepper and pepper. So she will look at us and like, they are little kids. Open your hand. So she will put the pepper on our hand. Put the pepper here and put the salt here. So I'll, I'll run with it. Mommy this, mommy, this is the salt and the pepper. I will use it to cook. But I said I will fight. All the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change comes. I will fight. I will fight till I see the word of God becomes manifest in my life. And until it becomes a reality, I will fight. I will continually fight. So it was a fight. It was a wrestle. My mom told me, eh, you see, you are about to go to middle school. And it's time for you to go to middle school. And there's this school in the slums. We want you to attend. You know we don't have money. I said, mommy, I, Christian, will not attend that school. Ha. <laughs> what is wrong with this boy? <laughs> and I did not go. Don't register me. I'll be at home. Because on our way to her, I saw... And advertising on TV. I watched a lot of TV. Black and white TV those days. Black. Other neighbors had colored television, but we still used black and white. The one you turn like this. <laughs> so I, I saw an advertisement for gifted children. If you're very intelligent, come write an exam. So I told my mom to apply so I can write that exam. So I wrote that exam, and that exam is for bright kids. But it's for, and it's children of the rich that is bright because they have good education. But I educated myself. Study to show yourself approved. So I wrote that exam and I was waiting for the outcome of that examination. My mom said, forget it. You know, this is Nigeria. They would rig it for the children of the rich and they would give them. They did that. But I said, I will wait. Eventually, I got that scholarship. And I went to one of the best schools in Nigeria. And I still got scholarship to study petroleum engineering even when my auntie laughed that it will never have been possible in my bloodline. And I broke that limitation. But limitations will not come to an end until you've learned to wrestle. So, like I said, principalities rule over families. Rule over communities. And they rule over nations. So they have legal hold on a people. Because there's been an exchange. They rule. It's legality. So you don't come into a jurisdiction and say, I, I want to change it. Your ancestors did something. So how are you going to change it? Yes, I'm saved by the blood. Yes, we recognize you're saved by the blood. But if you're going to put an end to that which your ancestors covenanted, you will fight. So the blood gives you authority to fight. And authority is for a fight. For a fight. That's why Paul says we wrestle. But against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in this world. Somebody say I wrestle. I can't hear you say I wrestle. Finally, let's go to Luke chapter 10. Are you blessed? I can't hear you say I'm blessed. Luke chapter 10. Let's start from verse number 18. And he said unto them, 
I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So Satan has lost his place. He's lost his estate. And if Satan has lost his place and lost his estate, if he's falling from heaven, he's going to be on the earth right now. So because Satan is come to your plane, he's come to your jurisdiction, he's going to wage war against you. He's not going to be your friend. He's not going to smile with your business. He's not going to smile with your children. He's not going to be happy with your marriage. So Jesus now says, Behold, I give you power. And that word power means authority, exousia, authority. I give you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now you see in that scripture there are two words used there. Power over power. Power over power. I give you authority over the power of the enemy. I give you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. So you would see that authority given here has a responsibility to thread. But who sees a snake and wants to put his leg on the head of a snake? It would take boldness to do that. That's why you see you have to exercise it. Because you're seeing a viper. And he's saying, step your foot on the viper. I know you're seeing the viper hiss. And he's trying to jump you. He's telling you, I gave you power to step your foot. That's why it would take faith and boldness. And most of the time, in doing that, don't think the snake is going to be nice with you. Remember God said to Eve. Thy seed shall bruise the head of the serpent. And the serpent shall bruise his heel. That means if you put your leg on the snake. The serpent will also bite. <laughs> but many of you when he bites. You, you, you are like. Oh God where are you? Oh you thought the serpent is an inanimate object. You think it's, it's a toy. You thought the serpent is a toy. It's just a toy. Just a... <laughs> I got power. <laughs> it's a living creature. It has venom. And that's why most of you say, oh, the enemy attacked me when I was praying. So you now give up praying. Ah, he will finish you with his venom. Because you prayed does not mean that instantly you're okay. Oh my, look at the power of God. No, it's a fight. Because didn't you see against the power of the enemy? So the enemy also has power. So don't, don't play. Don't play. But your power has to override his power. Don't you see he's a scorpion? And the sting of a scorpion is dangerous. But you have to consistently keep your legs there. If you keep your leg treading the scorpion, don't think the scorpion will not sting. He will sting, but you got the victory. So you must remind yourself what Jesus said. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. So keep your leg there. Even if he stings, keep your leg there. Amen. Until you get victory. Until I get victory, I'm not going to stop. Until I win, I'm not going to stop. Until you gain victory. Over serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy. And he says, and nothing shall by any means, any means hurt you. In order for nothing to hurt you, you must learn to exercise authority. The reason why things are hurting you is because you're not exercising authority. Exercise authority. Are you still here? Now look at that next verse. Look at what Jesus said as we round up. He said, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. So Jesus is saying, even though I gave you authority over demons and over the powers of the enemy, and you are happy and excited, he says there's something greater. 
for you to rejoice. It's a rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And I'll share this testimony as a roundup. Many years ago, I was reading this scripture in my room in college in Nigeria. And this scripture is a very popular scripture. I give you power. I give you power. I give you power. I mean, I know it. Every believer knows that scripture. But on this day when I was reading, light jumped out of the scripture. The rhema jumped out of the scripture. For the first time in my life, it hit me. I give you power. And then I threw my Bible to the side and I started rejoicing. Now, I had not read the next verse. I pushed my Bible to the side and I started jumping. Glory to God. I got power. I got power. I got power. I got power. Woo! I was just jumping around for 10 minutes. Woo! I got power. And then the Holy Ghost said to me, okay, okay, calm down. Continue your study. <laughs> That's why I said to you, the word of God is sweet. It's life. It's because you've not given yourself to it. He will reveal his character to you. When I now decided not to rejoice anymore and I continued from where I stopped, I saw the next verse. Rejoice not that I say to you, I give you power over devils. So I pushed my Bible aside again. How did he know that I was rejoicing? Because I had not read verse 20 when I started rejoicing. I had not read verse 20 when I started rejoicing for real. So when I continued reading, I saw rejoice not. So I pushed my Bible. How did he know I was rejoicing? Jesus, the same yesterday, the same today, the same forever. If he said it before, he can say it again to you. If he said it before, he can say it again. And then it was at that point the revelation of heaven dawned on me. It was at that point I stopped praying, Lord, I want to go to heaven because I saw your name. So another rejoicing began. My name is written in heaven. 